Greetings, this is Professor Lazarus again, and today we will talk about balance sheets. So what is a balance sheet? A balance sheet is nothing but another financial document that we accountants prepare to provide a user with more information about the financial position of a company. You can look up your textbooks for a more formal definition. An analogy that I like to uh, use, I read in a, another book a long time ago, was that of a financial photograph. A balance sheet is like a financial photograph. What do I mean by that? If you were all sitting in my classroom and I took a picture of you right now, the camera would record your postures at the moment the flash went off. But one millisecond after I took the picture, all of your postures could conceivably change. So similarly, the balance sheet records the financial position of a company as of a certain date. It could be as of December 31st, 2012, or as of April 30th, 2013, etc. Now the balance sheet is broadly classified into three main sections. Assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity, also called shareholders' equity. What is an asset? I like, like to use a one-word working definition of an asset as something that the company owns. Just as you own a number of things in your personal lives, what are some things that you own? Clothes, a car, maybe more than one car, a house, etc. All of these are your assets. Similarly, a company owns or can own a number of different items as well. Now, for balance sheet reporting purposes, the assets are further subclassified into several subsections. The first subsection under the asset group would be a current asset. So, what is a current asset? By definition, a current asset is cash or any other asset that can be converted into cash within one year. And GAAP specifies which accounts form current assets. Here I've just illustrated two of them, cash and accounts receivable, as examples. Accounts receivable, also called AR. What is an accounts receivable? When does an AR come on a company's books? AR typically comes about when a company sells a product or provides a service on credit, on account. On account is another term for on credit. So again, if you were a company selling clothes and you sold clothes to a customer on credit, then that creates an accounts receivable on your books. So in keeping with the one word definition of an asset, and that is something that the company owns, what is it that you, the business owner owns, or the company owns when you have an AR? In this case, what will happen is, the company owns the right to receive money from the customer at a future specified date. So initially when the company sells those clothes on credit, that creates an AR, the company's AR goes up. When the customer sends in the money, makes the payment, and the company receives that check, that reduces the company's AR. So that's a little bit about how AR comes about on a company's books and how it goes down. Next, we have other sections that broadly fall into the umbrella of long-term assets. The first of these subsections that fall under the broad umbrella of long-term assets would be property, plant, and equipment. And some examples of accounts that fall in the property, plant, and equipment subsection would be land and building. Then you have another subsection called intangible assets. Some accounts that fall under this subsection would be goodwill and patents. Then we have another subsection which is kind of a catch-all uh, section called other assets and one account that typically falls into this other account, other assets section would be deposits. What do I mean by a deposit? Let's assume you're starting a company for the first time and you need to set up an account for the utilities. So you call up the utility company and because you have no prior history with that company, they say to you, send us a check for $1,000 as a deposit. And once your company establishes a payment track record with them, a good payment track record, let's say for six months, they will return that thousand dollars to you. So the thousand dollars that you sent into that company is not a payment for your bill. It's just a deposit that the company is going to hold till they're satisfied that you have 
a good credit uh, record, a good payment record with them, and then they return the money to you. So your company owned that money all along. Hence, it's an asset for you, even though the utility company is physically holding on to that cash. And so on your books, on the balance sheet, you would classify that as a deposit. So when you add up all of these subsections, that will give you a total asset dollar figure. Okay, so that's a little bit about assets and the different components that make up assets. Then we'll move on to the next section called liabilities. A one word definition of a liability would be something that the company owes. Do you owe anything to anybody in your personal lives? Most of us do. It could be student loans, it could be a loan for your car, a mortgage on your house, money that you owe for your taxes. So these are all liabilities to you. Similarly, a company has various types of liabilities. One would be accounts payable. Accounts payable is an account, it's a liability account obviously, and it is used when the company purchases items on account for everyday use. So let's assume that they go to a uh, office supply store like an Office Depot or Staples and they buy uh, supplies on credit that would create an accounts payable on the company's books. Oftentimes students tend to get confused between accounts receivable AR and accounts payable AP. Well don't. Look at the words carefully. Accounts receivable. That means a company is going to receive something and one way the company would receive something would be if they were to have sold a product or provided a service. Conversely, accounts payable. Focus on the word payable. Why do you have to pay? You have to pay because you purchased something. And in this case, you would have purchased something on credit. So accounts payable would be one account. Wages payable, you're an employer. Every day your employees come to work for you. But do you pay them every day? Probably not. So at the end of each day, let's assume you pay them once a week on a Friday. So when your employees finish working for you on a Monday, don't you, the employer, owe them some money as of the end of that day for the work that they have done? Yes, you do. And the next day when they come in and do another day's worth of work, you will now have owed them for two days, Monday and Tuesday. So this, these items will be reflected in terms of wages payable. And when do the payables get off your books? The payables go off your books once you make a payment. So whether it be a payment to Office Depot or Staples, or whether it be a payment to your employees once you make a payment that brings your payables down. Then both of these payables, both of these accounts come under, under the current liabilities section. Now what is a current liability? A current liability would be basically a liability that you will pay off within one year. Now the next subsection under liabilities would be long-term liabilities and again you could have different accounts I've just illustrated one account long-term notes payable you buy uh, a car for instance you sign a promissory note with a bank and oftentimes those car payments are made over many years so all those payments that you have to make all the uh, principal balance that you owe on your car past one year after making one year of payments that principle would be reflected in your long-term notes payable. The amount of the original loan that you have to pay off within one year, that would be classified in the current liabilities section. Then we'll talk a little bit about the stockholder's equity. One way to understand the stockholder's equity would be the owner's claim on the assets of a company. And typically, again, there are different accounts that make up your stockholder's equity. One would be common stock. When does common stock come about on the company's books? When you first form a corporation, in consultation with your attorney, you will file the necessary paperwork, and as a result of that, you will issue what are called shares. Shares are another word for stock. When a company owns only one type of stock, it's common stock. If a company chooses later to sell a second type of stock, that would be called preferred stock. So common stock represents ownership interest in a company. If you and your friend hypothetically were to start a company and you all uh, decided to issue 1,000 shares and you owned 400 of those 1,000 shares, then your ownership would be 40% of the company. But all of the 1,000 shares 
would be reflected in the common stock account. Now, when you first issue common stock in consultation with your attorney, you also, and also based on state regulations, you have to establish a value for that shares. That value, it's a semi-arbitrary value, but it has a lot of legal implications, could be called a stated value or a par value, depending on your state regulations. Retained earnings is an example of another account within the stockholders' equity family. The retained earnings account typically holds the company's profits. Every month as a company generates profits, those profits go into the retained earnings account. So the retained earnings account keeps increasing every time the company generates profits. Conversely, every time the company has losses, the retained earnings account decreases. Another type of transaction that causes your retained earnings to go down would be the payment of dividends. Dividends are a distribution of the company's profits to the shareholders. And so every time a company declares dividends, then those dividends come out of the retained earnings account because that's where the company's profits are held. Another way to understand stockholders' equity is to think of that as a net worth of a company. We don't use the term net worth when it relates to companies, but we tend to use the words net worth as it relates to us individuals. So you all have heard of the term a millionaire. Think about it. What makes an individual a millionaire? If I were to have a million dollar house, does that make me a millionaire? And the answer is no, not necessarily. So what makes me a millionaire then? If you look at the accounting equation here, total assets equals total liabilities and stockholders equity. That's assets equals liabilities plus equity. If you rearrange the equation, your stockholders equity would be the difference between your total assets and your total liabilities. So in order for me to be a millionaire, I would have to have the difference between my assets and my liabilities to be at least a million dollars. So going back to my earlier example, if I were to buy a million dollar house, let's assume I don't own any other assets, just for simplicity's sake, just that one asset. But if I owed, if I borrowed $900,000 to buy that house, that means my stockholders equity then would only be the differential 100,000. That hardly makes me a millionaire may give me bragging rights that I have a million dollar house, but it does not make me a millionaire. However, on the other hand, if I bought a million dollar house with cash, outright cash, and I don't have any other liabilities, then I can say I'm a millionaire because the difference between my assets, million dollars, and my liabilities, zero, is equal to net worth or equity of one million dollars. So that's an overview of the balance sheet uh, containing the three broad sections, assets, liabilities and equity. We've gone through the different subsections. Wherever applicable, we've talked about accounts. And let me leave you with this thought. One way to understand accounts is think of the assets, liabilities and equity as families. And just as in the human family, there are family members. Each of these accounts, again, represent family members that belong to each of the three broad family groups. So with that, uh, I'd like to sign off. And as I always say, we accountants work our assets off. Thank you.